Very good. So, <clears throat> um, so in relationship to in relation in relationship to the idea of relationship in a spiritual context, mm. um, I've always been fairly conservative in my viewing my perspective. So, what I thought I would do is just give you a brief history of my thinking, mm. and so it'll be a, part, a point of departure and then i then i would love to just explore with you your your ideas your practices and your philosophy because um i realize i realize i realized a few years ago that um i didn't know anything about post-conventional <laughs> sexuality and romance mm. I, i've never really thought much about it Mm. And I'm very curious because I know there's a lot I don't know. So mm. I, want to, I want to expand the boundaries of my, my thinking and my understanding about what's possible because I'm very interested in the relationship between enlightened awareness mm. and cultural evolution. Mm. And consciousness and culture are one process, I, I believe, and I think you would probably agree with me. So. Yeah. Um, it makes sense to me that as, as our consciousness evolves, then our cultural values will evolve along with them. And that relates to the way we organize the human experience and our own human experience. Mm -hmm. And people who are interested in liberation for us first and foremost, should be able to express that liberation in all, in, in all the most important aspects of human life. That's where, that's where the rubber meets the road. So yeah. that would be the background context for our discussion. Mm -hmm. So my, my feeling was, that um, I found when I, 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 um, I was very inter interested, influenced by Eastern Dharma. That's been my whole, my whole background. And when I was a <clears throat> young, young yogi, <laughs> I was, um, you know, when I was in my early 20s. I realized that my relationship to sexuality had been very conditioned by, by the culture that I've been living in and I didn't experience a lot of freedom in relationship to it. I felt like a conditioned robot. So, <clears throat> so I became very curious about what it would be like to be celibate for a while. Mm -hmm. And I, I've never been anti-sex, I've always been very pro-sex, but I wanted, I wanted my relationship to sexuality to be less conditioned, more free, not just co co compulsive and uh, compulsive and so deeply conditioned. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so I decided to take, to take the vow of celibacy for a period of time. You know, I, I wasn't in a monastery, I was living in Manhattan, surrounded by beautiful women everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I practiced celibacy uh, strict celibacy, very strict celibacy for almost three years, and it was very and it was very interesting because um, I uh, I learned more about my relationship to the mind mm -hmm. through struggling with with this, the practice of celibacy for those three years than I did in all the years I'd been meditating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I gained a lot of self-confidence as a result because at a certain point, I realized that my, my, my chosen mental discipline in relation to that practice for, for that period of time, that my mind was stronger than my body. And I know that a lot of men, I came to discover later after I became a teacher, a lot of men are very intimidated by their own experiences of, of, of lust and sexuality and sexual desire. Mm -hmm. And because the, 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 fee, the feelings of lust and sexual desire are so powerful, that many men lose their, <clears throat> their, their center, their, they lose their, they lose their self-confidence. They feel very, yeah, often very victimized and not in control. Mm -hmm. So that period of three years, of almost three years, really gave me a lot of self-confidence in that area. And then of course, at the end of that time, I fell in love with a girl and, and had a, and got involved in the romantic and sexual domain of life once again. And, uh, and that was that. And uh, 
when I became a teacher, and, and for me, it was always very clear when I made up my mind that I wanted to be free, that I wanted to search for enlightenment, that I didn't want anything to interfere with that. And I was, at that time, I started to become aware of the fact that in a lot of, I guess, conventional relationships, even conventional postmodern relationships, that many people seemed, they were, I felt that there was a lot of compromise going on in these romantic sexual relationships. I didn't feel that people often offered a lot of dynamic freedom and independence. Mm. And again, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gross generalization, but I think there's a lot of truth in it. Mm. And I was very clear, I didn't want to compromise my desire for liberation. And um, when, I went, when, I, when I met Alka, the woman who became my wife, and we've been married for 35 years, mm. what drew us together was I told her I want to be free more than anything else. And she said, I want to be free more than anything else too. Mm. So anyway, that was a long story, but eventually, after I met my guru and I underwent my own transformation process, we had separated and then we came back together. And I said to her at that time, if you want to be with me, you have to want this as much as I do. And she said, I do. Mm. That, was, that was basically my condition for being back in a committed sexual relationship together. And so we've been together for 35 years and we're, we, have a, we have a good relationship. We're, we're both happy together and there's a lot of trust between us. And it just feels, it feels very, it feels, it feels very sweet. Mm -hmm. Our relationship feels very sweet and um, mutually nurt nurturing, nurturing and, and loving. <clears throat> so, so when I became a, when I became a teacher and a guru, uh, you know, in 1986, and I started getting involved with lots and lots of people, I started to see how in so many, in so many romantic and sexual relationships and couples relationships, and couples that had children, there was so much compromise going on in relationship to the, to this, to the, to the deeper spiritual aspirations. People were compromised in so many ways. And I, I, um, because not everybody wanted the same thing. People wanted different things. And when sometimes when people start to spiritually awaken, this, the, the, it led to also their the, the relationship started to fall apart because they didn't want the same thing. Some, some, one person wanted spiritual freedom and the other person wanted other, other things. Mm -hmm. I started seeing this is just a very, this is a very complex territory. So another thing that I noticed <clears throat> is that um, some of my students who had been practicing the, the Dharma with me very seriously for a period of years and had been, and had been, uh, had not, hadn't been in sexual relationships when they, at a, when, when they decided to get back into a sexual relationship, I started to notice that the minute they started having sex, after not having sex for a while, for a period of years, or, they, they lost the plot. They got totally, they, got, they, lo they lost the higher, higher context of meaning and purpose. Mm. And they got totally lost in the sexual, in the sexual experience and they lost touch with, with, with depth, meaning, higher context and higher purpose. Mm. And I found that very disappointing. <laughs> So, so, so my, my, my position has been most of the time that um, I've, I've never, I've always been pro-sexuality and, and I've been, and I've, and I've been married my whole adult life. But I found that the romantic and sexual relationship is, seems tends to be one of the places when so many people get trapped in all kinds of neuro neurotic patterns. And there's so much unfreedom. And so what I wanted people to do is kind of to, to, to do whatever they needed to do to straighten that out. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and often I would encourage some of my students to, to practice celibacy as I did for periods of time in order to kind of get their own mind straight mm -hmm. in relationship to, to their own sexual identity. And this is very powerful for men because of how because of how overwhelmed by sexual desire men are and get how confused they get by it. For women, um, the, the the more important issue was that women often feel, you know, because of hundreds of thousands of years of biological and cultural condition, they feel that there's a pre-conscious assumption and belief that unless I'm with a man, then I'm then I'm not whole. And so, for, so a lot of women would find that if they, if they entered into a period of abstinence, 
not just of, of sexual activity, but of their identification with, with, with being in a particular role, they started to find a, a deeper freedom and a deeper autonomy from which they could then re-engage with the sexual mm -hmm. romantic process from a place of greater freedom. So, and you know, and when people did it seriously, they, they gained enormous benefits and were usually very grateful for, for, the, for the spiritual work that they did in, in, that, area, in that area. And then, and then um, as I told you, my attitude's usually been very conservative. So I always felt that people, if they're gonna sleep together, then they should be in a committed relationship. And I didn't think that it was appropriate for people who are committed to higher spiritual development to be casual about their lovemaking. I thought love, if, you, if, you, if we're going to be making love together, then it should be in a, it should be in a committed relationship. We don't have to be for, together forever, but at least in that context, I, I didn't think that people should, uh, should, treat, should, should treat sexuality casualty, ca casually because I, have, I felt that more often than not, it seemed that uh, love and romance created as much suffering as it did happiness in the long run. Mm -hmm. And that's why I thought we need to be very careful, careful in this area of life, careful and very conscious, and very responsible. So that was kind of my basic attitude about the whole thing. So, so just to be, speak honestly about myself, I told you that I felt, I'd always felt that my slightly conservative predisposition in relationship to this area of life was the right and the true way. <laughs> But then I realized, I realized, I don't know, I think it was literally about seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, I kind of started to see through my own position and not, not, not that I, what I felt, not that I thought that was wrong, but I felt there was many ways, there's many, there's many other ways to look at this that have, that are equally valid and equally appropriate and equally spiritually powerful. But I haven't, I haven't explored any of those. And that's what I wanted to speak to you about. Mm -hmm. Because I know that you've explored polyamory and you, and you have a, all philosophy in relationship to, to love and to sex and to romance and to human relationship. So I'd love to hear about some of your ideas about it. And I thought we'd just have a conversation and see where we end up. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure to have this conversation with you, Andrew. And I, um, I, I just have a lot of respect. I have a lot of respect for um, both the clarity of positions that you've held and also your willingness to look within and question yourself on these things i really respect that and um yeah i mean i think i think you know a, a, a beginning point that we'd both be agreed on that we probably would have been agreed on through the whole you know course of our relationship with this topic is that human sexuality and intimate relating is dynamite you know it's very Absolutely. powerful it's very powerful territory and should be engaged, you know, um, cautiously. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> In certain Indeed. ways. And so, and I think the way of then relating to it, there's different, there's different ways, you know. And um, yeah, there's a few, there's a few different pieces that come up for me. Um, in, in, in terms of reflecting upon the path that I've been on here. And, and I think for me, um, you know, if I just speak for, for my own journey, I, I was um, in monogamous relationships entirely until six years ago or something like that. And I think it was about six years ago and I was in a partnership where we'd been together for three years loved each other deeply, committed relationship, desired future, um, where on one level, there was just a, um, that there was like an evolution of my relationship to love that happened. Mm. Where I, it was actually even, we even had a conversation about marriage once. And after, in that conversation, it's like, there was a word that went through, there was a sentence that went through my awareness, which was like, Oh, if if I marry her, then she's the last woman I'm ever gonna have sex with. <laughs> <laughs> and there was just a reflection that happened in that moment of the kind of the just like the the arbitrariness of that in a certain way, like the kind of absurdity to that. And so like, well, but why is that necessary? Just because because that happens, then that happens, you know? And 
I mean, the woman in question is a very kind of um, rested in her body, um, liberal, centered, naturally connected to her sexuality woman. And I, and I thought, it occurred to me quite quickly, I was like, oh, well, you know, well, actually, if, okay, if we were to get married, and then at some point we did feel that we wanted to explore in some other territory, I, I think she'd be cool with that. So, you know, okay, so, you know, but it was, the, it was, a seed was planted and there was just an evolution on one side of my relationship to love where I, I became of the position that just because I love someone deeply and I'm committed to a long-term relationship with them and I'm committed to sharing my life with them does not need to come with lifetime sexual exclusivity. And if our communication structures and our um, emotional maturity and our ability to be in empathic connection with each other around it is solid enough and mature enough, then actually this could be a profound path of growth to differentiate those things. And that really connected to me to my other reason why I started to explore non-monogamous forms of relating, which was I became just very clearly aware that that was where my trauma lived. What, what, do, you, what, what do you mean? That, um, I became aware that, um, how do I put this? Like, I, I, had, I had worked solidly on and with myself for about six years, knowing that I had trauma, emotional trauma around um, abandonment within my primary attachment relationship. Okay. And that, that would play out through deep insecurities and fears about my partner engaging with someone else or having some having some erotic connection with someone else. I became yeah. aware that, and, and what I realized was I'd worked really, really hard on myself for, for about this six year period, talking therapies, self inquiry, you know, a lot of consciousness work. And it really, it had shifted that much. It, it had shifted that much. And so I became aware, there was a certain point where I was like, if I'm serious about liberation, if I'm serious about healing, if I'm serious about moving through what is um, clouding my ability to remain true to the alignment that I wanna hold in my life all the way through, in, through into that's my embodied stand in the world, then I have to face my deepest fears. And these, this is where my deepest fear lives. And so that was my second reason to say yes to this journey. One was an evolution of my relationship to love where it felt like actually this feels in alignment with the way I increasingly understand how love can work. And the other was, this is actually the place that I'm most afraid to go. And wow. so if I'm really serious about liberation, this is where I have to go, especially since I had proven to myself that not going there and trying all the other ways that I possibly could <laughs> didn't work. And, and I also was aware that I had reactivity around this area. I had judgments of people who did open relating. I was, I was immediately emotionally charged when there were topics around this happening in the room or whatever. And it was just a, a kind of, hey, John, take a look in the mirror moment, you know? And um, and I would say that in the next six months of the very beginning of the exploration that we entered into, I probably experienced more healing wow. um, than in the previous six years. And, and I would not, and I would not claim that we did it perfectly. And it was simultaneously one of the most frightening, painful, challenging dark night of the soul underworld journey experiences that I've ever been through in my life. And I've had a few of them. So <laughs> that was, that was, that was, it was very, very painful and challenging and frightening. And there were certain things in the process that just, like I, my perception is that, um, you know, you and I are also dedicated to there being uh, genuinely awake and 
integrally developed and evolved beings on the planet who can be transformational agents for cultural change. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so <laughs> you and I probably also have the same experience that it's one thing for someone to be able to operate at an integral level of cognition. It's an entirely different thing for, some, for someone to be able to operate at an integral level of emotional maturity or psychosexual development or um, aesthetic development or all these other really, really important lines of development. And, you know, something that I became aware of, and I, I even would joke about it for a period that um, non-monogamous relating for me became the most powerful pathway of, it, of extending my other more embodied lines of development in the direction of <laughs> into a genuinely integral um, level of development than anything else I'd done before, because it's a forcing process. It, because, because the reality, Andrew, is that um, whilst some people can um, manage to do non-monogamous, multi-partner um, relating and sexuality on a, uh, without there being too much stuff that's kicked up, too much emotional stuff, it's possible, but generally it requires the people involved to not cross a certain line of intimacy with each other. Absolutely. I can yeah. see. And, and, and my experience, you know, even <clears throat> in witnessing of the last six years, everyone I've witnessed closely in the journey, including some of the most integrated and evolved human beings I've ever come into contact with, is that there is a rule here, which is that basically whenever two people, whenever one person, and it could be two, it could be one, it could be more, cross that line of intimacy with someone where they really start to get opened up by the connection, it is vulnerable. It, this, this is a very vulnerable territory, not non-monogamous, you know, because actually even monogamous relating, opening up that space is vulnerable. And the reality is that what I've come to realize is that um, we, all of us have, there are individual and collective traumas that we all participate in. And my traumas on an individual level are to do with my attachment history, it's to do with my relationship with my mother, my father, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. And so there's a, there's a certain uniqueness to that in me. But what I also have realized is that there's collective traumas around intimacy, love, sexuality, and freedom. But essentially, there's traumas around this, the, the two vectors of development that are fundamentally challenged by any relationship, whether it's monogamous or non-monogamous, which is our ability to be in connection with someone deeply and intimately and simultaneously to be truly in the authentic stand of our own sovereignty individually Absolutely, sure. yeah. that that those that mm -hmm. intersection is basically the the equation that every relating experience particularly those that take us more intimate demands that we find some kind of answer to and when you then add in the choice to work with forms of relating that inevitably trigger some of the deep individual and collective wounding that actually most um, that most challenges most of us to really stay true to who we really are whilst we're in these deep spaces of intimacy, it sets up a forcing process. And the forcing process is like it, it you you gotta you gotta work it out. <laughs> you gotta work it out. And and for me that became a profoundly vulnerable, profoundly humbling, profoundly powerful path of massively upgrading and updating my level of communication maturity, my, and really my relationship with myself on the most, in what were formerly the most, the places I was most disconnected from myself, the places that I had least established integration within myself, the places that were tra traumatized little caves living in the back of my body somewhere. I had to establish connection and an entirely different ethic of being with myself in all these places. And, and, and basically what for me all of this comes down to in a more esoteric sense is it's like, this is the soul body relationship. This is the relationship between each person's soul and their embodiment. And actually that 
relationship is a bit of a mess for most people. And, sure. um, and, and actually, if you, if you, you know, if I'm serious about wanting to participate in the emergence of human beings who are awake to who they truly are, all the way down to their base centers so that they are anchored in that realization, that freedom, that power, that creativity, that alignment with what is most true all the way into their body, then a descent process is fundamentally necessary as well. And the descent process, you know, it's like if we use the model of the chakras, it's like, it's not just through the heart. Like, I mean, I realized my development for a long time, my, my level, my, the level of consciousness I had attained to um, extended as low into my body as my heart for a really long time. And yeah, yet, not, not, yeah, below that. not so much. Like, no, mm -hmm. I think like, you know, as if I was tested emotionally, I would easily recourse to quite separative emotional reactivity in certain ways or, and certainly, you know, I've just described like when I was tested around sexuality or, 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 you know, the possibility of maybe my partner's attracted to that guy over there or something, you know, it would activate deep trauma, which of course means deep separation in me, you know? So the descent journey, if we're really serious about awakening, landing all the way through so that we have genuinely empowered forces of awakening on the planet, then it has to descend through the emotional layers of the solar plexus, it has to descend through the erotic layers of the sacral center, and it has to descend all the way into our survival, our, our survival drives um, in our base center. And so that's the kind of path-based rationale for me on like um, the why. And I know that I'm also a bit different from a lot of the people I'm surrounded by. I'm a very purposeful guy who's, who has these motivations to take it all the way. And, and I'm also surrounded by a lot of people where it's like, they, you know, they have a different view of love and eros that where they perceive, you know, than that which is conventional, where they, you know, they've recognized that there is an innocence to eros, which is, unseen in the majority of our conventional culture that that we have so much conditioning and shaming and guilt and fear around this very powerful force oh, um, so much. that doesn't need to be that that it's not true to the energy itself and, and you yourself have spoken about you know erotic energy or sexual energy is one expression of the evolutionary impulse you know and, absolutely um well, a couple of things I'd like, like to ask a couple of questions just before we go too much farther so, um, so you, yeah, I want to ask you a couple of questions just so we can clarify the territory. So you expressed, you, you talked about the distinction between initially what's purely a physical intimacy mm -hmm. and going beyond physical intimacy, even though physical intimacy can be the pathway to a deeper mm -hmm. interpersonal spiritual intimacy. And you were saying that um, that it's possible to have to experience physical intimacy without it, without it getting to, without crossing that boundary. For, for some people, some people can do that. For some, right. for some people. But then when we cross that boundary, we're getting into very deep, dangerous and powerful territory. So what I wanted to ask you a couple of things is number one, if you, and I'm very intrigued by a lot of things that you said, if you feel that this, process of this radical descent and inclusion of all dimensions of our being all the way up and all the way down is a, is a fundamental part of the complete em embodiment of our spiritual potential, you know, awakening the embodiment of our spiritual potential. In, the, in, in this polyamorous context, does, does this kind of physical and emotional and spiritual intimacy is it necessary, is it a prerequisite and necessary that it occur within the context of a, commit, of a, of a mutual commitment with the other person? Mm -hmm. So is, is, in other words, is, it, is, is, it, is, it, is, it, is some kind of commi commitment, commitment or committed relationship within other or others a prerequisite for this to be a truly, to be a catalyst for a genuine spiritual process? You know, what, what is it within that context that contributes to it being a genuinely spiritual process? Right? Yeah, so, number, so, so number one, does it need to, does, there, does it, is the commitment a prerequisite? Because we all know that um, 
the casual lovemaking where there isn't any commitment has is it's just its own kind of freedom and pleasure. But it, it, most people, most sensitive people would attest that it doesn't go very deep and it's ultimately not very rewarding. Yeah. So that's so so the, I wanted to ask you about the commitment issue, and the other the other question is in the other question is I'm very curious how how does one deal with the inevitable experiences of attachment, emotional emotional and psychic attachment to the to the other or to the others? Mm. How does one deal with attachment issues and jealousy? Mm. Mm. Which which inevitably is going to come up for most people, I guess. Who who would would, who, hadn't, who hadn't mastered the process that you, that you seem to be describing to me, who hadn't mastered that there were obviously there would be problems with jealousy and attachment, especially if there were, this was gonna happen in the context of openness. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because I think that, <clears throat> I think when people, have, when people are less open about, if they, if, in other words, if there's, if there's lovemaking or sexual activity with more, with more than one partner, if it's done in the context of secrecy and not, not vulnerability and openness and transparency, it's easier to avoid these, <laughs> these issues yeah. of jealous, jealousy yeah. and att attachment. But of course, if this yeah. is gonna happen in the context of vulnerability, transparency yeah. and uh, authenticity, then it's gonna bring these very natural and predictable gut level of violent and intense emotional responses to the surface. And I, I've gotten the sense from some people who are, who are exploring this post-conventional process that, 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 ma that, ma that mastering these, exactly these kinds of emotions and trying, ultimately being able to experience, in that, experience them but transcend them is, is an important part of what this deep, deeper experience of liberation and relationship to love and sexuality is all about. No? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a lot here. There's a lot here. So um, so first of all, I'd say like I'm not um, just as a as a beginning point to answering the first question. I wouldn't say I'm a particular advocate for polyamory. Like okay. I, what I the way I kind of describe what I stand for in relating these days is I'm I'm a stand for at the moment what I'm calling soul relating, right? And soul relating is. For me, it's when two beings choose to relate intimately with each other from a place where the foundation is, I recognize you as a being of innate wholeness and sovereignty, and you are on a journey of remembering who you truly are. And you have parts of you that are indivisibly one with the entire universe, and you have parts of you that are actually pretty broken and traumatized, and you're on a journey of you know, rediscovering who you truly are. And I'm the same. And we're saying yes to go deeper with each other from a place that's about saying yes to that journey mm -hmm. and, empower, and empowering that journey with each other through our connecting. And if you have that frame, then my experience is that actually within that frame, every relating style could, could be right at a particular time. Celibacy could be the right choice for people doing that at a particular time. Monogamy could be the right choice for people doing that at a particular time. Mm -hmm. Polyamory could be the right choice at a particular time and so on. It's, it's basically like, what is, the, if, what is the relating structure that if we are listening to, to the space between us that you know, when we make ourselves available to the growth that really wants to happen, when we make ourselves available to the evolution that, that wants to happen between us, what is the relating style that at this point on our path most seems like it would support that mm -hmm. um so that's really where i come from with it and and i would say that actually you know just to be really to be really straight about it the polyamory scene is frankly as messy in different ways as the monogamy scene <laughs> you know it's like and, i guess it would have to be right right <laughs> and there's a there's a humble recognition for me that comes with that which is that we're really just collectively still trying to work out how to be with each other. You sure. know, we're really just trying to work out how, how can I be really, how can I be as close to you as I want to be and still be me? And how, how can I even just still be me? <laughs> There's so many people who are really, you know, we're, we're really just in the early stages of this stuff. And within that context, there are people who I know who, who do it in a, 
you know, there's, there's deeper and deeper levels of maturity and mature engagement with the evolutionary process that's possible in, in all of those relating styles. And so, you know, that's just to say in answer to your first question, you know, within the polyamorous um, community or people who are exploring non-monogamous relating, my experience is that there are some who do it more casually and who do it more superficially. There's a lot of people who do it like that. And, and that can be, how would I put it? That can be quite carefree through to um, superficial and yet it can still actually contain some really significant and important growth opportunities and lessons for the people involved that are to do with, you know, how do I stay connected to me whilst I'm also connected to multiple, sexually connecting to multiple people? You know, there's, there's certain personality and character development lessons which can be powerfully, you know, supported by that process without it necessarily going into these deep places of like, okay, now deep stuff in me is triggered and now deep stuff in you is triggered and what are we going to do about it? Um, and, you know, there are people who do take it into those deeper places and sometimes they do it for love, you know, some, and sometimes they do it for the liberation of that's possible. Sometimes they do it for desperation because they're actually in a relationship with someone who they love so deeply, who and that person wants to go on that, go on that journey. And that can be a disaster or it can be powerfully liberating for that person involved. Um, but so that's a general lay of the land type of thing, which is just not to suggest that on this side of the fence, everything works just great, you know, <laughs> it, it, it really doesn't, you know, it's pretty messy. Um, as is human relationship itself. And within that still, there are people who, who engage this deep commitment with each other. And um, who- so, so, what, so what you're saying in relation to the commitment, so for some people there is a commitment, for some people there isn't. Yeah, yeah, that's a short way to put it, yeah. And, and for those, for the people who I've seen do it most powerfully, I mean, here's, here's the piece, Andrew. And it kind of is a segue into the second part of your question. When people, um, when people make that type of commitment to each other, it's, it, and, and when I've seen it really be powerfully transformational, it's anchored in love. And it's anchored in a, in a, in a love that says like, I'm not going anywhere. You know, like, yes, I may have sexual connections with this person and, you know, whilst I'm still in a relationship with you, or yes, I, yes, I may have erotic experiences, which parts of you find really scary and painful and vulnerable. And I'm a hundred percent here to go through a journey with you. That is about allowing us to exit the scary cinema stories that we're living in around all of this, to be with the feelings and the needs that come up in a way that where we can um, allow an experience of love to arrive and land in places in us that have been untouched by that in the course of our development thus far. And that is transformational. You know, I, I, one of my teachers once said, a guy who's very much around an embodiment teacher, and he said, it's very simple, said what heals trauma is having a different experience. A better experience. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's another positive, positive, yeah. Positive. exactly. Yeah, so if you and, and I would say that, like, I have been through um, underworld journeys of my own deepest fears. I, I, I even said, like, I would put it this way, Andrew, just another angle on it. When, when the woman I was with and I first chose to open up our relationship, we did it from a place where we basically were like, we want to grow in love. We have a sincere uh, impulse to evolve in love and to be taken by love on a journey that involves our evolution and our healing. And Andrew, I, I can honestly tell you, I have never in any other part of my life witnessed the initiation of a process with that commitment where there was an intelligence that started to move through our life, express, wow. expressing in each of us, meeting and having a having a connection arise with 
that person or that person where the nature of that connection was perfect to stretch us that next step in our growth, but not so intense that it would break us in terms of the evolution that wanted to happen. And when there were situations that broke, that broke us in certain ways, they were things that needed to break, where we had fundamental stubborn resistance to looking at certain pieces. And I, I could just honestly say I've never experienced such an obvious perfection of intelligence start to operate through the field of my and that person's relationships um, so clearly. And, and that's, it's like, that's the journey. That's the possibility. And, and in that, there were, I, I, in ways that I, it's, it's kind of funny to even speak about now, a number of times my partner, she would have connections or experiences arise with men where if you'd asked me beforehand, hey, John, what's basically the scariest, most triggering thing that could possibly, you could possibly imagine happening? <laughs> and I would say, well, well, actually it would be this or this or this. Those things happened, Andrew, you know, like it, those things happened. And, and it was incredibly painful and scary for me. And I came out the other side and it's like that experience of like, I'm still here. Like, and, actually I'm, I don't have anything like the level of charge around those topics anymore you know it's like I and but those, those feelings were around uh feelings of jealousy and attachment and feeling violated um well so I mean I would not I would not say that I'm done with that stuff by any stretch of the imagination <laughs> but I would honestly say like I I fundamentally do not I don't live in anything like the universal trauma that I used to live in around these I'm, I'm sorry, what did you say? I, I, I don't live now in anything like the universe of trauma that I used to live in. The oh, I see. Trauma. Like I, my sense of ease around these topics is fundamentally different compared to where I started. And yes, I've still, I've still got a way to go for sure and i don't actually know anyone in this field who hasn't got a way to go still but can i can ask you just can i interrupt you yeah. one, one question along these lines yeah in in the in the in the pra in the practice you're describing which sounds very profound is is there a conviction this is, and this is a very open question is there a conviction that if one was tr had truly mastered this practice then one would no longer ever be triggered Mm -hmm. If one's beloved had any kind of intimate experience with anyone else, would that be a sign of, of attainment? Yeah, in a certain way. Um, I, I, I'm yes, and yes, and I'm wary of that. So, like, yes, but just because I was just listening to what you were saying, and it seems yeah, like that could yeah. be what you're implying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I, when we first started doing this, I had a I had a vision at one point, and it was like it was a vision of being in a space where people were exploring open open sexuality, and it was it was like my partner was engaging with other people, and the vision and the embodied experience I had it was like the, my being all the way down to the cells of my body had entered into such total trust of love that it was fine but like, there was no there was no distrust of love there was no suspicion of love there was no kind of stories that i was retreating into about my about whatever the painful thing you know and that did anchor something in me of like it was like i was given a vision of what's possible in a certain way and and i would then to share how you know I remember one of my teachers telling me at one point you know John for these deepest fears and pains to really transform what may actually be needed at a certain point is you may need to be able to set up a situation with your partner where perhaps someone that someone else that she's relating with you will get together and you can actually witness her engaging wow. with, with that guy 
And wow. there's enough, there's enough love in the space that whenever your nervous system gets to a point where it's it's really a, it's really a kind of like okay I need this to stop, you can ask them to stop, and and they will stop, and you can then um, recalibrate, you know, re, uh, self and co-regulate your nervous systems with your partner, come back to a place of connection, and then maybe they engage again, and then again when it becomes too much you can say stop and they stop and same process again and i've known people do that kind of process i've witnessed it a number of times where people are deliberately working with the process in that way and i've also witnessed it and i've witnessed it be very very powerful for people and i've also witnessed it um it's like um where people have been in spaces where they can witness their partner engaging with someone else and the, and the, there's such a sense of connection whilst it's happening that the person witnessing can even move into actually in the polyamory scene as it were there's this word compersion do you know this word no I'm not very compersion good. it's a, it's like a word that exists in this community and compersion is the feeling of feeling joy and celebration at, with your partner engaging with someone else wow and so and i can really relate to that like i've, I've been I, I would even <laughs> i would even describe angie like i think the first the first time i ever went to one of these spaces with the woman that i began this journey on i was terrified at the I, beginning understandably terrified and yet in being in that space, I can honestly tell you, I won't go into the journey I had in that space. It was a deep journey, but after I'd been there for like a couple of hours, I remember saying to her, I was like, I'm good. If you, you know, if you, if you want to explore anything you want to explore, it's okay. You know, that some a safety had landed in me. And and when when a person can have reference points for experiences like that, where what on one side of the fence, we most fundamentally fear, can we gain it reference points and data points for the experience of actually, I, I can feel okay in that space. I can even feel good in that space. And I, and I can feel connected to my partner, even if um, they're connecting with someone else. Those types of experiences fundamentally, I believe, rewire these attachment related um i can feel i can feel they would have to because I, I can i can feel in myself as you're speaking that these are these are very deep yeah emotional structures we're dealing with here that are, that are literally in one's guts and in one in, in one's soul another question in this context is that in in a in a conscious polyamorous context does one what well, does one always have a primary relationship in other words one particular individual that is your mm. true partner and and in that context you and your partner would agree that you will have other lovers but that individual is your is your main partner mm. is, is that usually how it works or, or would it or would there not, or would there be no uh, hierarchical distinction between yeah. Who, who one's who, who one's with yeah there's 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 different structures that um the different people work with and there's i remember i'm just trying to remember there's a guy um reed mahalko who um is a he's kind of like a, he's calls himself a sex, a sex educator who's a, a total nerd about all of this stuff who's worked it all out and presents models on it it's quite interesting but <laughs> I rem remember Reed talking about this once and he was giving a presentation of like the different kinds of structures that he's observed people in the polyamorous community going with. And it's certainly not always a primary partner structure. That's one, that's one possible structure. I remember him also talking about pod relating, what he called pod relating sometimes, like a dolphin pod, you know, and like that's where there's maybe a small group of, let's say five people who all are relating with each other and they may or may not also relate with other people outside that pod, you know, that there can also wow. be small communities. There can be, you know, sometimes there's triads or quadrads of people who may have, they may have hierarchical differentiations within that structure. They may not, it may all be equal. 
and they may or may not also relate with others outside of that outside of that small circle like there's and then there's I remember re talking about like there's what he called lone wolves as well you know and that's and lone I think he talks about like they're people who tend to have multiple partners but they never really truly enter into like an ongoing relational you know kind of context with them so I, I, I'm, there's other there's other structures you mentioned as well, but what I've observed is that often people are in a kind of primary partner um, structure. Then there's people, I remember people have spoken to me about, I've witnessed it a couple of times as well, more what they call like relationship anarchy, which is like where there's no, there's no hierarchical structures whatsoever. And basically wow. the, you know, the, the, the impulse, the, the, the kind of the, how do I put it, the commitment that the different people in the system have is simply to listen to what's most true. And of course, Andrew, as you can imagine, there's massive bypass, you know, possibilities with all of these things and, and also potentially very powerful growth, you know, so. And especially, especially with the sexual dimension of, of uh, yeah, of experience being so front and center. <laughs> When one's turned on, what feels true in that moment may. What I would also say is like something, uh, uh, something I observe changing and growing and evolving within the polyamorous community currently is there is a much greater awareness that is developing around the prevalence of trauma. How mm. trauma isn't just something that certain very damaged people have trauma is actually pervasive that all of us have, as I say, some individual pieces and some collective pieces. And that that plays out through challenging, painful attachment dynamics between people in these contexts. And, and actually, even as I look out on certain organizations or uh, like um, crews of people who run events and who are big in this space, who run tantra events, neo tantra events, all this type of thing. I can definitely divide them into those who are more trauma aware and those who are much less trauma aware. And um, that's a, that's an evolutionary shift which is happening. But there was a book that came out this year called Poly Secure, which wow. um, is has become become very popular, and it's and it's. Yeah, it's it's you know kind of um, really looking into these pieces around attachment theory, trauma, and the, the the dangers and the potential healing and liberation that can happen through non-monogamous forms of relating. So just to return back to one thing we mentioned a few minutes ago, so so just just to make sure I'm clear about it, that the idea is that um, that being able to ha have these intimate experiences with in a polyamorous context would trigger unresolved unresolved stuff places where one has been traumatized and one can learn how to face and be with what the, the reactivity without shutting down yes. and at least the theory would be that whether that could that could clear up the trauma in some kind of primary or fundamental way that could be very emotionally and spiritually liberating yes yeah exactly yeah and the, a, a piece a piece which is important to consider there is if you if you think about it part of the psychological wiring of any traumatic piece in me or you or anyone else a kind of inherent part of the wiring is the assumption when i'm in this i'm alone and and just if you if you consider that look into yourself look into others you know like sure, sure. I, know, I, know, I know it's true cool. i don't have to think about it's it true. yeah it's it's like part of the trauma wiring when i'm in this i'm alone so these spaces that I'm speaking about can actually fundamentally address that. If you can have an experience where, oh, I, actually I am in this and I'm not alone. Actually this same piece has, um, has been activated, has been triggered in me. And I can also feel that my partner is, is deeply attuned to me right now. And I can feel even, even if my partner's actually sexually engaging with someone else right now, I can still feel that they're deeply attuned to me. You can feel like it starts to really like shift certain very sticky wiring. You know? Oh no! I, <laughs> I, 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 that, that's, that's that's very clear. 
but in this context, would would um, if if not getting triggered would be a sign of uh, of emotional freedom and liberation and wholeness and, into, and deeper integration. In that context, would any could could any or would any experience of attachment or jealousy be seen as being legitimate? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think I, I think the way I would see that, and I, tell me if I've misunderstood your question, but when you understand, when you're looking through the frame of like the fears that live in all of us around the loss of love and the loss of intimacy, then all of these fears are legitimate always anyway, you know? Sure. And like, so, but... Um, oh, I, no, think I, 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 think, I, I think I think I get where you're going. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying, I think, to, trying, to, exa- I'm trying, trying to examine the fundamental the fundamental principle yeah, of circle and just yeah. from another from another angle. Yeah, I think I get where you're going. And if I, yes, yes, for sure, because like the okay. way I see that is, you know, here's here's the way I see that. On a soul level, we all have some part of us that knows the truth that this, the interconnected soul field, um, and by that, I, I'm differentiating that from the indivisible absolute, but the interconnected soul field, we all have a part of us that knows that love is the truth of that reality and that love is the interconnected field that connects us all. And that love is fundamentally transpersonal, all pervasive, it's everlasting, and you know that it's not a finite reality. Like on a soul level, got it, right? However, on a kind of embodied human animal level where yeah. actually this, this human animal was born and it will die. There, there is a finiteness to, the, to that section of reality, to that frequency of reality that this human animal actually understands very well. Like, and so, you know, there is a legitimate, in my view, vulnerability in parts of me knowing that when my that, that there is fundamental risk or in this context that you know like maybe there is some maybe maybe through my partner connecting with that person something is going to shift tonight maybe something is going to shift in her maybe some new phase of her growth is going to open up maybe some new incredibly important connection is going to land or and actually maybe that may shift that may affect that may change our journey with each other and even if love is pervasive on the soul level even if that's true my embodied self knows that there's 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 certain magical wonderful profoundly beautiful dimensions of this particular relationship which are finite and i will never experience again you know and actually are profoundly precious to me and i think there is a a legitimate vulnerability there that's based on the reality of how beautiful and precious every fleeting moment of intimacy and connection truly is and and i think there's beauty in that you know and and i think there's beauty in in the in the heart and the heartbreak and the fear of that and it's an affirmation of the power of life in my view rather than it being a kind of you know uh, um yeah, like a, a loss of something. And I, and I think then what I, if I were to imagine what I currently perceive would be a really integrated being in these contexts, a really liberated, integrated embodied being, I could imagine that they would feel parts of them, that they would know that whatever happens in that room, whatever their partner does or does not do, there's, there's a certain stability in their being and presence, which is like, Nothing touches this. This is not up for negotiation. And there would also be certain parts of them that would be deeply connected and vulnerably with, oh my God, this connection is so precious to me. And I know that actually, if I'm really honest in the way that all of us should, you know, in a certain way, even if you're in a monogamous relationship, your partner might meet that amazing person tomorrow that, you know, everything could change. Like there's never surety, but when you're relating in that way, it's even more present, the kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's even like a relational version of the Buddhist, you know, the Buddhist teaching on impermanence. Like there's a kind oh, yeah, of sure. relational impermanence is so presently, clearly kind of like, you know. <laughs> yeah, when, so when one's lover comes back from, 
loving another 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 person. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you need to know about or hear about, or is it something that you stay away from? And is is is, is her is, would be her private experience, or is is part of a polyamorous and human relationship that one needs to know, needs to hear about, it, needs to participate in it mm. in some way? Um, different people have different agreements, and um, there's a range of agreements that people work from, and that can extend all the way from some people do it with a kind of don't ask, don't tell type. Type, you know kind of version I, I've never done that because it doesn't really feel true to what the point of the journey really um but yeah then it there is then you know if I speak about my own journey I, I think there was certain there was when I was more vulnerable and 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 it was more edgy for me I felt like I needed to know more like I felt like and would want to ask more questions if that was okay about you know my partner's experience and certainly it always happened with the context I, I knew she's meeting that person tonight that's where she is right now you know and I'm I'm here at home you know having a, a vigil from my own painful evolutionary growth you know <laughs> or my own my own ability to be with and face myself and meet myself in this context it's it's powerful um and yeah, I feel like I needed to, I wanted to ask more questions then. And I noticed that as time went on and I felt more relaxed, I you need to. needed to ask less questions. But it, but it was always within the context of transparency and honesty about what was going on. Yeah. So I want to ask you a more general question. Um, so obviously men and women, sexuality is, is different in fundamental ways yeah. and we we both know that from evolutionary biology that men, that men are programmed to sow their seed far and wide mm -hmm. and so this is a biological imperative thing mm -hmm. for, for men mm -hmm. and for that reason most men i know have a relatively insatiable experience of sexual desire and obviously it diminishes to some degree as when one gets older but they but if one could in in some kind of another dimension at times one would want to make love with a different woman every day different attractive woman every day because of course there's always this the, the particular allure of that which is new unexplored <laughs> unexplored territory is is one uh, Sexually finds particularly compelling. And, and it became apparent to me at a certain point that, 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 that this was like an absolute situation being a, being a, male, a male human being. That, that, as, that as long as I was in this body, I was, going to, I was going to make love to an infinite number of women to which there would be no end until I dropped dead and you'll probably continue again, <laughs> probably in the subtle realm until I took rebirth and <laughs> it'll continue forever. So, so, so therefore I, because I realized this was part of my own biological conditioning. I didn't make, I didn't make a problem out of it. I, I kind of, I always, I always feel that the presence of of, of sexual desire, sexual and romantic craving is a sign of well-being, is a sign of health, is a sign of vitality. Mm. And in, whether one acts on it or not, it's, it's, it's a sign of life mm. and uh, vib vibrancy. But I, um, I realized that, it would, that from a certain point of view, it would, ne it would never be enough and I'd never be satisfied. Mm. Mm. And so, and then, I, then when I really accepted that deeply, I was able to let go of the need or the need or the, or the desire to want to have more, more lovers. Mm. And I also felt that, uh, especially in the position I was in as being a, being a public person and a spiritual teacher, I felt it was very important. Mm. I was, that I was very careful in that area of my life and I always have been, I never, mm. I never crossed that line. But I, but I was wanted to ask you this question that um, I often wondered if because I know that different that 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 spiritually inspired 
people have been trying to crack this particular nut for a long time. And, I, and, and, I've, been, and I've been trying to sort out what, what which, which sounds more like what you're speaking about, which is, which is, which is coming from a, genuine, a genuinely spiritually inspired desire to fearlessly in, in, embrace the human condition and a conscious aspiration for, for profound awakening and deep in, in total integration. And on one hand, and what's just a desire to have to, make, to be able to make love with as many women as one can possibly make love to yeah. and, and get away with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can't sort out the difference. Yeah. yeah. Because, because, because at least for men, this particular aspect of life is, is, is fundamental. At a bottom line is, is insatiable. We'll never get to the point where we say, okay, now I'm, I'm done or mm -hmm. it's done. Because the because the evolutionary impulse experienced at a biological level is mm. it's comes from a, from a from an eternal source. Mm. Mm. It's the mm. becoming of it's the becoming of the universe that, that I, I I understand to be ceaseless mm. and eternal. Mm. So so in that context, the question is: Well, how do I embrace this? How do I embrace and fully embody and experience and express this impulse? and fully experience its liberating power and potential without getting trapped by it. And that seems to be the fundamental, the fundamental spiritual question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so here's, here's how I see this. I, I perceive that all human beings are at some point on a journey around the degree to which their consciousness is as strong or is at least as strong as their roles, right? So- Now that's interesting. Yeah. So for most people, for most of the path, their consciousness is not as strong as their eros. Correct. And their eros, and we know, I mean, eros is life force and eros is profoundly powerful. And my perception is that human beings are actually, we know how powerful it is. I mean, we experience that both in the sexual experience itself, where we're blown open beyond our boundaries in so many ways, and we're awed with the profound, like, oh my God, that's incredible. That's one way we know it. And another way we know it is when we do things we regret, you know, and when human beings do things they regret, and basically what has happened is that their consciousness was overpowered by their eros and um, by their desire. And that is quite possible for very large sections of the path. And I even think like if you if you see things through this lens, then you, you know, I, I sometimes, you, you know, look at look at examples of, um, for instance, orthodox, uh, orthodox Islam, for instance, where in certain cultures, women are, uh, there's orthodox, you know, laws around how women must cover so much of their skin. And, you know, there's that's, a, that's, that's, that's so they wouldn't tempt exactly, all because, the male brutes. Exactly, right. Because there's a kind of presumption in the culture that if a woman was to have more of her skin visible, then the men could not be held responsible for what they might do, you know? Now, on one level, that is profoundly not okay, you know? And on another level, it's an interesting admission of like, actually, we're just going to be honest that we are just, we're not mature enough to deal with this yet. This force is so strong, we are, and we are not strong enough. You know, it will, it can overpower us. And actually that's very much, you know, it's, that is a prevalent reality of the human condition. Absolutely. And, and that said, there comes a time in the path where our consciousness is as strong. And, and I think when- If, 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 if our spiritual practice is strong, mm -hmm. if there's a significant yeah. level of attainment, I would say yes, but, but I mean, there's been too many powerfully awakened spiritual masters who's, who, can do so well in this area? Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, probably it's the case that just strong consciousness is itself not enough. And that's, exactly. you know, and that's what I would, would, that's where I would get into this as well, which is like, it actually then becomes about our relationship to Eros itself. And how much, you know, for instance, 
how much we can allow and welcome erotic energy to circulate through our being as part of our relationship to life itself, rather than making it about an objectified other that is, you know, kind of one that we want to kind of conquer or, or you know, kind of have conquest with in some way. There's, it, can we allow, um, yeah, can, can we actually allow an, an interflowing between our consciousness and our eros in a way that welcomes both? And I think that question directly gets to the mind over body tension that has existed in human culture for a really long time. And in a certain way, there's a healthy version of it, which is the healthy version is I'm going to um, really try and strengthen my consciousness so I'm not overpowered by my heroes. Um, but there's also a fundamentally unhealthy version of it, which is, um, which is colonization. It's like the mind and, and consciousness colonizing the body and trying to, this, this, I remember one of my teachers talking about this, like, you know, a shadow of the way that our consciousness can work with our eros. And this, this exists within um, kind of tantric and neo-tantric communities where you see guys who are there and they're, you know, their, their consciousness is attempting to use their eros for their awakening and enlightenment. And basically their body becomes an objectified tool that is to be used for their consciousness's awakening. And in my view, that there's a certain violence to that, that, that actually does not recognize the multi-dimensional layers of sentiency and life that truly exist all the way down, and that our bodies are deserving of much more respect and, and honoring than that. And yeah, then, well, um, but of course, but if you over identify with us, it's gonna, it's gonna it'll distort our personality and pump up our ego pretty big. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, and the flip side of that is men, for often men in these contexts where they're actually like they're marketing deeper consciousness, but they just actually really want to get laid. So, <laughs> yeah. So, but, but okay. just to ask you, sorry to interrupt you. So, just ask you a question. So, okay, I like the way you put that, and I agree with you. That would would you say? Would you venture to say that unless one's consciousness became stronger than one's experience of eros, unless one's consciousness was strengthened through serious and committed spiritual practice and higher development, and unless that consciousness was stronger than one than one's experience of eros? And one would would you venture to say that one would not yet be prepared to practice polyamory with deep integrity, or would that be going too far? I think there's an element of truth to that. Mm. Right? I think there's an element of truth to that, and and I would also say like I don't, I wouldn't say that the consciousness needs to be stronger than. I don't, I don't even know whether I believe that consciousness can be stronger than, but I think it can be as strong as. Well, let me let me put it to, to make it very specific with me in terms of the element of choice. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. We, we, we'd have to agree that actions come from conscious choice in yeah. relation to this area. And not everybody would agree with that, but if we would agree that actions come from sexu from conscious choice in relationship to sexuality, yeah, then uh, that would mean because because once yeah. the once once the sexual mechanism is turned on, it has a mind of its own, as we know, and yeah. it's it requires enormous and yeah. enorm enormous clarity of mind and, and yeah. higher moral development to be able yeah. to keep one's to be mentally and spiritually clear-minded in the face of that overwhelming power yeah yeah and so it would just seem it would seem to me that it would seem to me that unless one had attained that level of of mindful self-awareness in relationship to eros and one's own psyche and biology it would be very difficult to navigate with integrity the very complex and challenging waters that you've been speaking about. Yeah, I, I would, that's, that's a big ask. <laughs> it, I, yeah, and, and I would also say that I can immediately think of an, a, a reasonably large number of beings that are in my world who totally exist in that way. Cool. Like, um, so that they are not that they are very connected to the truth of what's happening in their erotic layers. And they are definitely not overpowered by them. And, and it also it also depends on like what are the agreement structures 
between the people involved. You know, I remember like at the beginning of the journey that I had with the partner that I started this with, we had an agreement, which was that of course, nothing would ever happen with anyone else before we checked in with each other, right? But a later agreement, and so that absolutely would require, you know, kind of like, okay, something's, something's happening and no, because that's not within my agreement structure, right? right. But then, you know, at a certain point, our, there was more ease and relaxation in our system and our agreement structure changed to it's preferable, you know, <laughs> to, to check in with each other. And if there's something real that moves in the moment and you really and you feel in integrity and it feels authentic, you can you can operate in a way that feels authentic to you and you tell me about it afterwards. You know? And so that requires less that that more requires a kind of like am i in integrity here like yeah, it's, yeah. It's, that's really the inquiry then it's it's a slightly different inquiry am i in integrity am i am i pushing something am i forcing something am i avoiding something you know am, or is this in integrity and so yeah and and i think um basically a major a major question that this whole journey forces people to look at is what's the soul embodiment relationship and how, how good is that relationship? How harmonious is that relationship? How, how, or is there, are there, uh, you know, kind of impulses of domination, exploitation, colonization, use, you know, is that actually the way that my soul and body relationship is working or, no. I've always, I always, I always felt in, in the romantic and sexual relationship yeah. that, that the most important foundational ingredient that makes all things possible more than anything else is trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I would actually fundamentally agree with that. And I think it's, it's, it's trust within us and it's trust between us. Absolutely, well. yeah. yeah. Is that, because then, because then there, then there can be freedom and space. Yeah, and, and also that, you know, I, I actually feel like a lot of the main ingredient to what comes down, like what is the fundamentally healing ingredient when we're talking about rewiring some of the most painful trauma patterns within us, it's trust. Because actually, if you look at any of those places in me or in you or anyone else that still exist in places of trauma, they fundamentally do not trust like they are they exist in massive states of distrust so if there can be a shift where frequencies of trust start to be how those parts live rather than distrust that changes everything you know absolutely absolutely and then it becomes like okay and that that's the that's the flip in a certain way from you know the don't ask don't tell or you know relationships where there's a kind of even a unspoken consent to the fact that one or other might have affairs or something like this it's like you know actually can we say yes to the reality of human the human the human condition and even say yes to being taken on a journey in it um but we prioritize doing everything from a place of trust and, and for me actually what i'd say is like that was game changing because whilst i whilst I used to have so much fear and insecurity and pain around the idea of like, oh, what if my partner, you know, had some kind of um, infidelity moment or whatever, when you're existing in a non-monogamous structure, it's like, well, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the point here anyway. So, you know, yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Hmm. So do you have any, do you have any, um, Look, looking at these because because sex with the our, our shared agreements around the sexual bond, uh, these foundational structures for culture and have been for time in the morning. Mm -hmm. So as we as so as we're moving from a kind of so we go from traditional to modern to postmodern to post postmodern and meta modern shared co cultural context, which is and this is this this is a, a new world space. It doesn't really exist yet. Mm. But it's trying to emerge through, through mm. a, you know, a growing number of people who are entering the integral stage of development. Mm. And part of entering the integral stage of development is the recognition of how deeply, how deeply and profoundly conditioned we are. We're all mm. more than we'd like to believe or even recognize more like conditioned robots than free agents. Mm. And the more we wake up, the more we recognize mm. 
mm. how unfree we are and how unconscious our behavior is in so many areas of life. And of course, all the, all the more so in relationship to sexuality and love. So in relationship to this, this idea of cultural evolution, evolution of consciousness and cultural evolution, do you have any kind of general feelings, ideas, beliefs, convictions about how we should, about what kind of ideas and new shared agreements that we should all be, we should be exploring, or those of us should be exploring who believe that we are yeah. part of this pioneering group of people who are yeah. at the leading edge of this adventure into meta-modernity meta or post-post-modernity? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and just to say, Andrew, I, I'll need to jump off in a minute because I have to. I'm I'm going to go and be a daddy to my little boy. Oh no, I, that, that's great! It's been delightful. Yeah, um, but I, I can answer that question. So, yeah, I think what's from an integral perspective, I think what's actually most important is if we have a developmental context on human human life and human growth, then I think we and and if we're also humbly kind of honest about the dynamite that relationship and sexuality represent as far as human development and growth are concerned, then we can enter into a developmentally constructive conversation about like, well, what really would be um, the relationship stru structure or style that would most suit, you know, can, can we be flexible about recognizing that different relationship structures offer different gifts for different phases of growth? And can we then start to, you know, I think Robert Augustus Masters has a quote where he says, you know, relationship is the ashram of the 21st century. And I, I don't see it that absolutist, but I think, you know, we can start to see that our choices around relationship um, can be profoundly significant and powerful for our holistic growth. And rather than relationship being, a kind of side part of our life which provides us with some kind of homely satisfaction and sexual satisfaction hopefully thank you like it becomes this kind of crucible of growth and development and nourishment and healing in really significant ways but not in a kind of cookie cutter one size fits all type of way it's it's if we're developmentally sensitive and aware of the different gifts that different relationship structures hold then people can be invited into and supported uh, into what would be, you know, what, what really would suit your growth right now for the current phase of your path. And I think that's the difference between a kind of pluralistic, green, you know, kind of just, you know, helpful radical deconstruction of the conditioning and assumptions that we have around relationship into a kind of like, well, you know, could be anything into a more integral perspective, which is like, well, yes, it could be anything. And what would most suit people as far as where they are on their developmental path right now? You know? So, so what you're suggesting is that uh, at, the, at this leading edge of this emerging cultural context, we should we would, we would ask us to not have any fixed ideas about what it's supposed to look like, and, we, yeah. and, and part of part of our adult growth would be openly exploring and considering different options and different ways this could actually work. Yeah, I, I would say on one level, it's like, yes, not having any fixed ideas about what it should look like. And on another level, it's having very fixed ideas in that, you know, making sure ideally that the priority and the dedication is to more love and more truth. You know, I, I'd, I'd want that to be baked in at every level, you know, and that I'd want, you know, the reality of uh, so that we are, we learn together to be really clear about the difference between when a choice is coming from an authentic and connected impulse and when it's coming from a disconnected narcissistic impulse or you know a kind of an impulse that's actually about I just want to I just want to have my experience and I don't really care about the impact on you you know it's so that we also refine our awareness around what and in a certain way it, it is it, that takes us back to the fundamental equation that all relating asks us to answer which is the intersection between connection and sovereignty and how can we do the how can we how can each of us answer that equation in a way that um is really in integrity with love and truth yeah i've always i always i've always felt that uh in a, in a truly spiritually enlightened leading edge culture that autonomy and communion or sovereignty and coherence 
to be yeah. able to happen in the same time in the same space. Exactly. And yeah. that, that, that would be what we're, what we're shooting for. Yeah, totally agree. Well, thank you, John. It's been delightful, man. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And, and, and it's been educational. And uh, let's continue the conversation and see where we can go and explore other topics together. But it's been delightful. Yeah, I, I'd be delighted to do that. It's always a pleasure for me to, I, it, it activates my heart to speak to you, Andrew, because it's like, I, I just know that um, you're one of the people in my world where I can so deeply relate to the drive, like the, the drive that you have and the drive that you stand for. And, uh, you know, all the way, I, it's a pleasure for me to have contact with beings where I'm like, oh yeah, I can, I can feel that's what they stand for as well. And Thank you, John. Thank you so much. All right. Lots of love and let's do it again soon. Ciao, ciao.